Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is another UK Quantum Fluids Network webinar. And today's speaker is Mark Lamantia from Prague. And he's going to talk about visualization of flow in superfluid healing form. So, whenever you're ready, Marco. Okay. Hello everyone. So today I will talk a bit about flow visualization and superfluid helium four. The focus will be on turbulent flows at relatively high velocities, and uh, it will be about uh, visualization with uh, solid particles. So as uh, Dima already said, I work in Prague in Czech Republic and. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, study mostly the flows of superfluid helium. So the first thing I can show you is the phase diagram of this uh, unique uh, fluid. So here you can notice that the temperature are rather low, very close to the absolute zero. And uh, maybe it's important to note that Experiments are mostly performed along the saturated vapor curve, this one. And here, uh, at this point, there is a transition, second order phase transition to the superfluid state where uh, some unusual properties are observed. And uh, here, I'm just going to briefly On here, Marco. Hello, Marco. I think uh, you broke up. To be more precise, of the flows of superfluid helium is that uh, uh, the Fourier law is actually not true for this kind of flows. And this indicates indeed that this fluid has unique thermal uh, transport properties. In order to account for these properties, over the years, several models have been proposed, and the most popular one is the two-fluid model, in which there are two components, the normal fluid, which is viscous and carries entropy, and the superfluid, which is inviscid and does not carry uh, entropy. And uh, here I wrote models because, indeed, there are various ways how these two components uh, are coupled. So uh, the main idea is that there are two components that interact somehow, but the interaction depends on the, on, let's say, on the type of flow. And then another important uh, characteristic of this fluid is that the superfluid component can be described as a quantum fluid and this, in a sense, means that topological defects, quantized vortices, can uh, exist in this system. These uh, objects have a very small uh, vortex core size of the order of Langstrom, but they can be very long, of the, size, of the same size of the container where they are, where experiments are uh, carried out. So one could say that quantum turbulence, as it is written here, can be regarded as the interaction between this tangle of vortices with the fluid flow. So there are various types of flows that can exist in this system. And here uh, I list just the say, most important one, the, well, not really most important, but the two of them, there is counter flow, which is thermally driven and which somehow takes into account the exceptional it transport properties of the fluid, where the two components flows in opposite direction. 
And then there is the co-flow where the two components uh, flow together in the same direction and they are coupled. One can say at least that sufficiently large uh, flow scales. So today I will talk a bit about the flow visualization. So first of all, uh, broad, let's say, introduction to the topic. So the main idea is that you have some particles in the fluid, and these particles allow you to visualize uh, what is going on in the fluid. And here there are uh, a couple of examples, which are uh, pictures taken from satellites. Here you can see there are there is an island, here another one, and there is the wind, which is flowing over the island. And there is this vortex structure, this vortex strait, which you can see it because there, there are the clouds. So in a sense, in this system, these clouds can be regarded as the particles. So uh, the apparatus uh, we have here in Prague, it's made of a uh, cryostat to keep the liquid helium. Then we have laser and camera. And the principle is more or less the same. You have some particles in the fluid and you illuminate the particles and uh, you uh, track this, uh, uh, the light, which is uh, uh, the light that the particle uh, mm, scattered by using a camera. An important issue which should kept in mind when uh, someone talks about this experiment is that there is a difference between the scale, which are the physical scale of the system, and the scale which can be probed experimentally by using the experimental tools. So, as I mentioned earlier, the, there is the size of the quantized vortex core, which is of the order of Armstrong. And then there is the mean distance between the quantized vortices in the system, which can be loosely related to the Kolmogorov scale of classical uh, turbulent flows. And that uh, here, usually in experiments that we perform here in Prague, it's of the order of 100, 100 microns. And then there is the outer uh, flow scale of the system, which is of the order of, let's say, uh, a few centimeters. What are the experimental scale? So what is the size of the particles? The size of the particles is of the order of, say, a micron or 10 microns. And this is the smallest case that can be assessed. But in general, the scale is, is larger because uh, also take into account the uh, distance which the particle travels between frames. So let's say this particle size is really the minimum, but depending of the, on the camera features and on the flow features, usually the experimental scale, which can be probed, is uh, larger than the size of the particles. And somehow uh, this scale can be tuned, for example, by reducing the frame rate of the camera. So now I will uh, do a brief overview of some uh, early experiments in flow visualization. So uh, the first experiment I know about was made actually in Canada in 57. And uh, it's, it's, it's a curious to say that here the authors say that the details of this experiment will be published shortly. But I mean, couldn't find it actually. So it's a very short paper. So somehow they just report that these particles have been generated in the liquid, but that was it. And then in the 60s, there were uh, several experiments and the main idea was somehow to take advantage of the small kinematic viscosity of the liquid in order to get uh, flows at very high Reynolds number. And here it's uh, uh, an experiment which was done again in Canada. And this uh, figure here, it's interesting because it shows 
that there is actually a difference between the velocity of the particles and the velocity which one would expect from the theory for the fluid. So the particle velocity and the fluid velocity are in general different. And then I wanted again to mention this idea, which was uh, quite popular in the 60s. There are several papers on it. So the idea of using really of making a superfluid wind tunnel. So actually people tried to uh, did experiment with some kind of wings and they visualize uh, the, the trajectories of the particles in this system. Here, the picture are actually not taken in helium, but these uh, uh, images on the, on the right instead are a reconstruction from movies which were taken at the time. Then I would like to mention a few other uh, experiments, uh, especially th those related to jets, which have been, uh, especially in the 70s, they received quite a bit of attention, especially in the case of the counterflow jet, which is a phenomenon which has received, an, uh, let's say that, uh, does not really a consistent explanation by using the, for example, the two fluid model. And it's uh, it's a phenomenon that still, still needs to uh, find an explanation. Now I would like also to mention these experiments on vortex rings. In this case, we are talking about co-flow in the sense that the fluid is uh, uh, moved uh, mechanically by using a piston. But then again, you can do a similar thing by using a heater. So you get uh, uh, say counter flooring. But as I will show you later, far enough from the flow source, the, this object is actually quite similar to a vortex ring that you would observe in classical uh, viscous fluid. So uh, before, let's say, going into some more detail, sample of experiments, I want to mention that 10 years ago, there was this review where you can find some other papers about uh, this uh, flow visualization in helium. And also it's mentioned another important technique about uh, metastable uh, helium, uh, metastable, <laughs> molecules that are used to track the flow. And also I would like to mention that actually there are other uh, ways how to visualize flows of illiquid helium that have been used during the years, for example, shadowgraphy. But today we'll just talk about uh, particles, okay? So let's uh, start from an example of some thermal counterflow experiment so here you have a picture of the channel we use for these experiments. At the bottom, there is a heater. And here you can see there is the size of the channel. And these uh, units, this dimension are in millimeters. So here, you can have a look at the movie. So at the beginning, you see the particles that are going down because they are made of deuterium and deuterium is a bit heavier than uh, liquid helium. But then when you switch on the heater, the particle will start to go up and also down depending on the power you put in the system. But uh, the interesting thing is that in some condition, you see that actually these particles do not really follow straight trajectories. They somehow jumps. They, some, they jump, and this is something that you cannot really observe in water. And uh, this is really, again, an effect of the exceptional thermal transport property of the liquid. So again, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to somehow estimate experimental and uh, physical scales and compare them. So in this case, the length scale probe by the particles is related to the velocity of the particle and the time between the frames. And as I said earlier, this experimental length scale uh, 
can be larger than the size of the particles, but not smaller, of course. And then there is the uh, physical length scale, which here, for example, in counterflow can be uh, estimated from the vortex line density and the counterflow velocity. And then if you do the ratio between this scale, you uh, can, let's say, uh, have an idea on how the behavior of the particles in some flow will depend on the scale, which is being probed during the experiment. So here it's important to know this gamma, which is an empirical kind of parameter, which have been, for example, obtained from second sound experiment, also from numerical simulation. And it depends in generally on T, which is the temperature, and also G, which is the geometry of the channel. Actually, the, there is quite a big influence of the size of the channel on and the way in which uh, uh, the, the flow is uh, uh, developing. But in the experiment I have discussed today, I want to mention that this R, this ratio between the scales, is uh, a cross one, at least a uh, two order of magnitude. So we can see what is happening at scales smaller than the intervortex distance and also a scales larger than it. So here we have uh, the probability uh, distribution of the particle velocities at scales which are larger than the uh, scales in which this radius is, this, sorry, this uh, length scale ratio is larger than one, which essentially means a scales larger than the mean distance between the vortices. And we can see that the distribution is close to the Gaussian, as it is usually observed in classical uh, flows. But then if you decrease uh, the scale, you get these very uh, heavy tails, which uh, have been uh, observed in many different uh, type of flows of superfluid helium and uh, here you can see direct comparison between the Gaussian and the uh, tails. And as I just mentioned, this has not been observed only in counter flow, but also in some conflow, in some mechanically driven flow. And over the years, a few explanations have been proposed. So the, let's say the simplest one is the fact that if you have a straight vortex and you compute the uh, velocity distribution around this vortex, you find that actually uh, these uh, uh, tails, this exponent minus three appears. However, I mean, this explanation of course is consistent with experimental data, but does not take into account the fact that uh, the particles, as I said earlier, have in general a velocity which can be different from the velocity of the fluid. So in order to take this somehow into account, later it was uh, proposed another explanation, which is based on the occurrence of vortex reconnection. And here you can see a movie taken from this uh, paper. And you can see that there are these vortex reconnection occurring, these, uh, events, and uh, uh, it's possible to uh, estimate that uh, the probability of uh, uh, statistical probability of the uh, particle velocity in the presence of this reconnection event is uh, uh, consistent with the experimental data. So you can observe, again, this power law dependence. So the idea is that the particles interact with the vortices. The problem, however, in this explanation is that the particles are big. As I said earlier, they are about, uh, let's say, one micron in size, but the vortex size is one Armstrong. So right now, this explanation about the vortex reconnection is Let's say the, uh, 
the one that is more uh, probable, but still it's not clear how it's possible that such, how such a big object can, can somehow be influenced by an object which is much smaller. So nevertheless, this uh, property can be used uh, uh, to get an estimate of the uh, mean distance between the vortices in condition when you uh, don't know it. So, and we did it uh, in the case of uh, flow close to boundaries. Here we have again this bulk counter flow and on the other side, we simply move up the channel and we visualize the region of uh, a flow close to the ether. So here is the result of the particle velocity distribution close to the ether. No, sorry, in the bulk, as I showed to you earlier. And again, you see that this ratio is smaller than one. So we are probing scale smaller than the intervortex distance. And then if you do the same, but with particles which are close to the ether, you get something similar. But uh, the difference here is that actually to get these power law tails for the particles which are closer to the ether, you need to go to much uh, uh, lower scales. At least if one, if one takes into account this gamma value, which is taken from bulk data. So the idea is to uh, take advantage of this uh, thing to give an estimate of the intervortex distance. And this is probably more clear in this figure where there is the flatness of the distribution as a function of the length scale ratio. The blue and red symbols indicate the bulk uh, data. Instead, the black uh, symbols indicate data taken close to the ether. And as you can see here, this data close to the ether become close uh, to three, which is the value of flatness associated to the Gaussian distribution for a uh, length scales, which are actually smaller than. So the explanation uh, we give uh, here is that actually close to the uh, ether, there are about uh, 10 times more vortices than in the bulk. So uh, now I give you a short summary about this power law phase. So the main point here is that if you probe scales smaller than the intervortex distance, than the flow characteristic scale, you get something that you don't usually you don't get in Newtonian uh, fluids. And then also important thing that has been let's say proved experimentally is that quantized vortices concentrate in regions of low fluid velocity that is in the proximity of the boundaries. And then, as I told you already, this uh, fact that the uh, particle velocity distribution shape depends on the scale can be used to estimate the uh, mean distance between the vortices in condition where this gamma parameter is not already known. So now I will talk to you about another result, which is related to the previous one. Again, it's something which is, has been probed across scales. So a scale smaller and larger than the mean distance between the vortices. And this related to what is usually called uh, flight crash events. In a sense, in classical turbulence, uh, a particle tend to gain energy less quickly than uh, it loses it. So this is, so the, as you can see here in this graph, the buildup of the energy at a certain rate, but then when the particle decelerates, really it's occurring at much shorter time. And this <laughs> it's thought to be an indication of the dissipation of energy in, uh, these flows from a Lagrangian point of view. So another way of saying the same thing 
uh, is to use uh, the velocity increments along the trajectory. This is the trajectory. And you compute the, the difference between the velocity along the trajectories. And it's a quantity that can be somehow related to the energy of the, the flow. And this quantity is expected, this, the skewness of the Lagrangian long longitudinal velocity increment along the trajectory of the particle is expected to be negative, again, because of this dissipation of the energy. So the idea was to check if this thing is also observed in flows of uh, superfluid helium-4. And here, it's uh, the main result. These magenta points are classical data obtained from numerical simulation. This open point here, uh, these circles, are uh, co-flow data. Instead, these points here are counter-flow data. So from this, uh, we can... Uh, we can say essentially two things, that if we focus on the co-flow data and we plot in a suitable way the results, we see that the scaling is the same as it was observed in uh, classical data, a sufficiently large flow scales. Instead, at smaller scale, we really have uh, that uh, this skewness is around zero. It's not negative as it's expected in uh, uh, to be in classical flows. So uh, the main result here is that from the experimental observation, we see that the particles in turbulent flows of superfluid helium-4 uh, do not tend on average to decelerate faster than they accelerate. So an explanation which was uh, given in the paper uh, is that actually we can uh, the particles are too big, and so we can actually cannot probe the scale in which the asymmetry will be uh, observed. And uh, there are also some other experiments, older ones, which show that these quantized vortex reconnection are expected to be uh, symmetric in uh, uh, quantum, in flows of superfluid in four. So now, uh, finally, I will talk about, as I mentioned earlier, some experiments we did on vortex rings. And here it's uh, uh, the setup. So we have a heater and then a channel and when the heater is switched on, the, the vortex ring is generated here. If you keep the heater on for a long time, you will get a jet. We also did some jet experiments, but today we'll just talk about the rings. So here there are the experimental results. And again, here we use uh, the deuterium particles, and this is ob this object. You can see it, which is going through the field of view. We believe it's a vortex ring, and the size of this field of view is two by two uh, centimeters. Here, one can estimate the Reynolds number based on the literature on vortex rings, which is of the order of 40,000. So once we get these images, we can get an estimate of some quantity which is related to the particle uh, velocity and position, which we call it pseudo vorticity. And this was done essentially to compare different cases taken in different conditions, different values of heat flux. It can also be demonstrated that this quantity pseudo vorticity is proportional to the actual flow vorticity if you have enough. Uh, uh, particles, and uh, if uh, uh, movies are collected at uh, high frame rates, which is generally not the case for uh, this kind of experiments. 
But anyway, this is a kind of sc uh, scalar uh, quantity, which give you an estimate of the strength of this vertical structure. So here you see uh, on this picture, there is actually, uh, there are trajectories of the particles shown in the reference system of the uh, moving vortex ring. And here you get uh, this pseudo vorticity estimate. So these, uh, these numbers here should be taken not in absolute terms, but just uh, as term comparison with other uh, conditions. And here I can show you yeah, a movie of these uh, uh, vortex structures, this vortex ring. And uh, yeah, from these movies, one can get an estimate of the position of the vortex rings and also an estimate of the size of this object. So essentially what we did is to, was to make a comparison with uh, classical theory describing the uh, propagation of vortex ring. And uh, in this theory, you can get some similarity constant, which is related to the velocity of the ring, to uh, the position of the ring, and to the size of the ring. And, these, and the ratio between this constant is expected to be universal, not to depend on the specific flow realization. So uh, what we found is essentially here, we found that this pseudo vorticity can be uh, quite faithfully uh, track the position of the object. Here there is the, uh, the magenta line indicates the theoretical prediction and these red dots are the experimental data. Instead, this technique is not really able to get uh, uh, proper size of the object because essentially there are not enough uh, uh, particles because these are Lagrangian measurements. So uh, here now, short summary about these uh, vortex ring results. And these experiments were done as case larger than the mean distance between the vortices. And uh, as I said, this Lagrangian pseudo vorticity can be used to get an estimate of the strength of this object in the absence of Eulerian data. And actually, we also performed numerical simulation, and this was confirmed by a numerical simulation. And also, we uh, did some second sound experiments in order to measure the, the strength of this object. And yeah, in this paper here, there are more, de more details about the second sound measurements. So here are more or less my conclusion and I list number of topic which I believe could be useful to investigate in future. As I mentioned earlier, it's not yet clear how particle and quantized vortices interact. And then also the behavior of the fluid close to the boundaries is not well understood. The mechanism of energy dissipation and transport uh, still uh, are not uh, well described in the sense that uh, from the experimental data, one can get some fits that allow to build machines which exploit these properties. But on the other hand, these are fits. So, uh, And uh, an, an open question also, in my opinion, is why actually there are similarities with classical flows? I mean, we are talking about uh, quantum fluid, which should be different, should, be, should show properties which are not related to classical viscous fluids. So why these similarities are, are observed? Also, this is something that could be investigated, at least in my opinion. So thank you very much for your attention.
Yeah, thank you, Marco. So are there any questions? I see you. So either raise a hand or just unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, well, Patrick has a question. Hi, Marco. Uh, thank you for, for a nice talk. Uh, maybe I have one question about the reason why we see these uh, non-classical tails in velocity distributions in, in superfluid helium. Which explanation, which interpretation do you actually lean towards? Is it uh, because of vortex reconnections or because of this uh, pressure gradients near? On these vortices. I believe that it's, uh, I mean, particles are influenced by the pressure field. So they are attracted to the vortices and these vortices reconnect. So I believe uh, that uh, the influence. I mean, these tails are there also because uh, uh, particles are uh, influenced by the vortices, but they don't need to be trapped to show these uh, uh, tails. I think yeah, we published a paper on it with Mathieu, where we propose, I mean, we show that these tails are also there uh, in case the particles are not really trapped into the vortices. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah, wait. Um. Hi, Michael. Uh, very nice talk. I have a question regarding the uh, analysis of the flight crash event. You mentioned that um, the reconnection results in symmetric uh, behavior of the velocity. So that probably leads to some difference from the classical scanning. But your data seems to suggest that, that in co flow, uh, the scaling looks similar to that in classical fluids. Only in counterflow, the, the the behavior is different. Can you comment on that? Because uh, my I would imagine uh, vortex reconnection should occur in both type of flows, right? Yes, so the coflow data actually were obtained only at uh, scales larger than the intervortex distance. But we can see that while the scale is decreasing, uh, actually the behavior becomes a bit different from the classical behavior. And the symmetry of the vortex reconnection, which is something that has been observed also by the group of uh, Dan Laptrop several years ago. And this is an observation that was made as case at uh, a scale is comparable to the particle size. So one expects that the asymmetry of the reconnection would be apparent at smaller scales. So data in CoFlow uh, right now, I don't have really a lot of data at small scales. So, yeah. Well, I, I would imagine even for the reconnection, uh, the velocity behavior should be different because there's always a dissipation associated with, with reconnection, right? So as the particle move together and move apart from each other, uh, even the prefactor of the time scaling uh, could appear to be different. Yeah, but this was not observed experimentally. 
the experimental data lab drop showed that it's a similar. Then there are numerical data that show that it's different, but they are a scale smaller than the particle size. So the symmetry is there, and it makes sense from a theoretical point of view, but it cannot be probed by using the particles, I believe. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll ask a question. Um, so in uh, Lathrop's uh, videos, you can see that well, there's obviously quite a few particles sitting on the one vortex. Well, in the videos that you've shown, so it's it's not so obvious that uh, well uh, that there are, uh, well, the particles are along some vortex line. So is there any uh, difference in the visualization technique? Well, is there any experimental trick? Uh, the the difference is then the flow type. So in the case of laptop, actually there was not any flow. So there were just the particles and they took movies for a very long time and they found a few reconnections. And uh, in the case of the experiment I show, there is a flow, there is some strong flow. And we actually also depend on the scale which is being probed, which could be larger than the mean distance between the vortices. So yeah, the main difference is the, the flow type. You can observe quantized uh, vortex reconnection. We also observe them here in Prague, but we didn't focus on, on their study. Okay, yeah, understood, uh, thanks. If uh, there are no questions, then uh, well, thank you, Marco, again for thank you. giving this webinar. And uh, the next webinar is, I think, in uh, two weeks' time, 9th of April. And uh, I'm hoping to see you then. So uh, see you later. Thanks, everyone, for joining the webinar as well.